Excellent. Evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this lecture that we're doing this evening, the first in person lecture for the best part of two years. So, welcome to everybody in the room. Also, uh, welcome to everybody online as well. Uh, for the person, for everybody in the room, we're going to be recording. So, I hope you're happy with that. For everybody online, you know we're recording this because you're watching it. Um, we're going to save questions to the end if that's okay with everybody. Um, and uh, so, with no further ado, um, this is a particular interesting lecture for me because I have been working the Lloyd's Register and dealing with liaison with the MAIB for some time, and uh, I was the one that set the lecture up. So, um, I'd like to introduce Danny Harwood from the Marine Accident Investigation Branch, who's going to give us a lecture on marine investigation. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and hello to everyone online. I will try my best to stay in view for the camera and not start wandering around. Um, yeah, Danny Harwood, I'm the Deputy Chief Inspector at the UK Government's Marine Accident Investigation Branch. I've been Deputy Chief for about four years. I've been with the branch for 15 years. I've got a marine engineering background, 24 years at sea the service. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today, uh, if we can have a quick click please. Okay, I'm going to talk to you today about the role of the MEIB, uh, what our aims and objectives are, about the legal framework that we work under, and I'm going to talk through the investigation process so you get an understanding of how we work from the notification of an accident right through to the publication of the report. Can you change the slide, please? Again. As you'll notice, the technology is really good. I've got to ask someone to uh, flip from slide to slide for me at the moment. So who are the MEIB? Uh, we are one of three transport accident investigation branches within the Department of Transport. Uh, we're based in Southampton. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, Air Accident Investigation Branch, uh, longest standing, over 100 years uh, in existence, based in Farnborough, 55 people. The new kids on the block, Rail Accident Investigation Branch, they've been with us since 2005. Uh, they came in following a public inquiry into the Labbrook Road rail disaster uh, and the decision was made that for rail we need to have uh, a similar independent accident investigation capability to air and to marine. Uh, watch this space, there is work afoot uh, that the UK could end up having a road collision investigation grant very shortly, uh, consultation process going on for that. Ourselves, the Marine Accident Investigation Branch, uh, we've been established since 1989, uh, following the uh, uh, terrible disaster in 1987, held the Free Enterprise. A lot of us will remember that quite clearly. 193 lives lost. Uh, and at that time, it was decided that basically it wasn't appropriate for the people responsible for regulation, enforcement, marine policy, i.e. the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency as it was, to also conduct uh, marine accident investigation branch, uh, accidents and uh, the branch was formed. Uh, no sooner did, have we been formed, the first investigation that we had to do uh, was the terrible disaster down on the Thames there, uh, the Marchioness and the Bobel collision sinking loss of uh, over 50 lives. Since then, uh, MEIB have received well over 40,000 uh, notifications of accidents. Uh, we've conducted over 1,500 investigations, produced lots and lots of reports, and issued over 3,000 recommendations. Sole purpose of the MEIB is to establish the circumstances and the uh, causes of marine accidents, uh, and then to take steps to try and stop them happening again. It's not our job to apportion liability or blame. 
uh, and we work very hard not to do that. Our aims, obviously, is to improve the safety of life at sea and also to protect the environment. We need to satisfy the general public, uh, seafarers in particular, the family of seafarers, uh, that accidents are being properly investigated uh, and actions are being taken to stop them happening again. And then finally, it's a law. The UK uh, signed up for a member of the IM, uh, IMO and we are required to investigate uh, very serious marine casualties. Independence, very, very important to MEIB. Although we are part of the Department of Transport, like the other AIBs, we are functionally independent of the department itself. Uh, the Chief Inspector answers directly to the Secretary of State. Uh, we are independent of our regulators, but we're also independent of each other. Uh, we're not multimodal, we have different bases, uh, uh, and we must do uh, our own work. Having said that, uh, we do have an Accident Investigation Chiefs Council, uh, where the three Chief Inspectors uh, sit and the deputies, including myself, sit on that uh, council. Uh, and that's been chaired by non-executive chair, Sir Dick Garwood. And the aim of the council is to give the AIBs a bigger voice to promote what we do, but also to make sure that the taxpayer is getting value for money and we're not duplicating efforts in, in lots of areas. MEIB itself, we're based in Spring Place. Uh, we've got half of the uh, first floor uh, in the MCA uh, owned building. We have at the moment 42, maybe 42 and a half staff. For the first time in a long time, MEIB is fully staffed. We're just waiting for one new person to join and we've got full staff. So we're in a really strong place at the moment, moving forward. Uh, Chief Inspector, Captain Andrew Moore. Uh, I'm the Deputy Chief Inspector. I'm directly responsible to the Chief Inspector for the delivery of operational capability, the conduct of the comprehensive investigation, and the delivery of, of, of uh, relevant and accurate investigation reports. We have a four-team system at the moment. Uh, we've got blue team who are sat on call. Uh, the on-call team are at two hours notice to deploy from to anywhere in the world. Uh, the on-call rotor, the teams are on call one week in four. Any accidents that are reported in that week stays with the on-call team throughout any sort of investigation uh, from start to finish. And typically we're looking at about 20 to 30 accidents reported to us each week. Uh, once you come off your on-call week, you move into a standby mode where the team are then on a six hours notice to deploy anywhere in the world. And they will be deployed should we uh, commit our duty team uh, out to an accident site, or should we need uh, some really heavy lifting for complicated fire investigations, for example, or collisions. Um, the other side of the office, we have all our own investigation support staff who sort out all the accommodation, all the database entries, all the uh, data processing, uh, information management, we have our own IT team and technical department, which is uh, the envy of the world. We've got one of the best, if not the best, uh, technical capability of AIBs uh, when it comes to marine uh, globally. Uh, we have our own health and safety manager. Uh, we make sure we look after ourselves and don't get hurt. MEIB inspectors, uh, typically uh, our inspectors are ex-seafarers either ex-chief engineers or ex-ships masters, but we also have specialist investigators as well. Uh, at the moment, we only have one fishing vessel inspector. It would be great to have more because fishing vessels are our biggest customer and keep us busy all the time. We currently have two naval architects, one as a principal inspector uh, and one uh, as uh, one of our newer inspectors, uh, both members of RENA and uh, quite active members. Uh, we also have a human factors specialist uh, as well. Uh, 
uh, that uh, he's been with them now probably two years, next two years, uh, and bringing a, a whole new aspect to, to, to the work that we do. Even though our inspectors have their specialist knowledge and their nautical and engineering experience, we put them through an accreditation process, which normally takes 18 months to two years, and they have to fill in that sort of initial professional development, and then they become a certified Department for Transport Accident Investigator. And that's really important, especially if someone like myself is conducting an investigation into a collision involving a fishing vessel, and I'm stood up in uh, some sort of uh, coroner's court or whatever, and someone says to me, what makes you uh, uh, qualified or competent to investigate accidents on fishing vessels? And I'll then come back and say, well, I have all this experience at sea. Uh, however, I'm a DFT accredited accident investigator, and that's my specialist uh, subject uh, going forward. So what do we investigate? Uh, we investigate UK flag vessels that are operating anywhere in the world. We also investigate uh, any vessels operating within UK uh, territorial waters. Uh, we also investigate uh, all sorts of small craft that are operating on our in inland waterways, on our rivers, in our harbours, uh, and we'll investigate some leisure craft uh, as well, commercial and privately owned. Also, uh, in the last two years, we've started to investigate very serious marine casualties for uh, Red Ensign Group uh, flag states. These are our uh, overseas territories and Crown dependencies. We're conducting investigations for Isle of Man, Gibraltar, Bermuda, Cayman Islands, and we've just signed up an MOU uh, to include uh, Category 2, the British Virgin Islands, in that scope. And we're doing quite a few of these investigations and they're keeping us quite busy. A lot of our heavy, heavy metal, big, big cargo shipping are coming from our, our Red Ensign Group investigations. Also, quite often MAID is approached, Chief Inspector is approached and has to conduct investigations on behalf of other flag states and also support for the flag states. And I'm sure a lot of you will recognize, rec recognize this, and I know Andrew will. Uh, this is Viking Sky. Uh, uh, vessel in very treacherous conditions, suffered a blackout, came within one ship length and running aground onto the rocks. And we all know that the, the scale of the disaster that might have been with uh, almost one and a half thousand people on board. Uh, big investigation, a lot of things going on. Uh, I was asked to support this investigation, the chief inspector was, and we had to send our engineering team out to help do the engineering side of the investigation down, down on the uh, coal face. Uh, we also done lots of follow-up meetings that have gone down uh, and assisted, and we put a lot of effort into helping them write their interim report to get messages out. Uh, Andrew, as we talked about earlier, this is a case that's ongoing, very complex, and we're all waiting for, for the report to come out. So accident types, we investigate two basic accident types, casualties to vessels, uh, an occupational accident. So, as it says on the slides, casualties, vessel, really simple, capsizing, sinking, uh, collisions, fire, explosion, pollution, uh, all those sorts of things. But then we also do an awful lot of occupational accidents, falls from height, uh, confined spaces, machinery entrapment, lots of those, uh, and those can be uh, fairly traumatic. Current investigations, our workload at the moment, uh, we've got 28 investigations ongoing on our books, uh, which is about average now. Uh, 10 of those merchant vessels, uh, six lives lost, three of those uh, merchant vessels we're doing for the Red Ensign Group at the moment. As you can see, 12 fishing vessel accidents we're doing, and of those uh, 12, there was 13 lives lost. Uh, last year was a an all-time high or an equal all-time high for, for loss of life in fishing vessels and that keeps us busy and concerned all the time. We've got small commercial craft that we're working on at the moment. We've also got uh, a couple of leisure craft with six lives lost 
There are some interesting investigations we're doing that we haven't done for before. We're doing, in, we just completed and published a report into a jet ski accident. Uh, we've normally kept away from those, so we got involved in that. We're doing a very tragic uh, multiple fatality accident on a river involving paddle borders. Uh, and as you'll see on the bottom, uh, a slightly different uh, investigation for us that we're involved in a migrant mass fatality accident that happened last year. And then the scope of our investigation for that is revolves around uh, search and rescue efforts and things that went on there. Legal framework that we work under, our powers uh, all derive from the Merchant Shipping Act 1995. Uh, and we also have our secondary legislation, the Merchant Shipping Act and reporting regulations that sets out the detail of uh, what's required of shipping companies and what's required of us and how we do our business. Uh, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency very kindly uh, publish a marine guidance note to make that even easier for people to understand. So the investigation process, being an accident investigator is a very exciting uh, career. It's very varied uh, and it really uh, does grab your attention and it, it's a, a really worthwhile thing to do. Obviously we're interested in what happened, when it happened, where it happened, how it happened. And those in our business are relatively easy to establish. Uh, it doesn't take an awful lot of investigation to find out those four things. But what we're really interested in and what we work really hard to establish is why these accidents happen. A lot of analysis, a lot of work goes into that. Why does it make sense to a person to actually do what they did? Why did it make sense for, for this particular thing to happen? And then, of course, most important to us, what can we do as a marine accident investigation branch to help prevent the current? And that's where we come with publishing our reports and issuing recommendations. So the investigation process starts with notification. Someone has to tell us that there's been an accident uh, that we can respond to. The accidents themselves are categorised, so in our regulation, uh, most people who are in the industry will understand what needs to and what doesn't need to be reported. Uh, for certain accidents, you need to report it by the quickest possible means, and that's needed by a telephone call. Uh, but People like the police, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, uh, Harbour Masters, they also have a responsibility to report to us. Uh, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency typically discharges that responsibility by giving us access to their, uh, what we call their BOSS database, which is a live running system that we're monitoring from our office, what's going on around the UK from all the Coast Guard stations. And probably I'd imagine over 50% of the accidents that we put onto our database are first picked up by our investigation support team monitoring the Coast Guard's uh, BOSS systems. So this morning, Graham, I don't know if he's online listening in, uh, would have picked up a report this morning. Uh, he would then look at it, he will read it, and he will assess the report. And the first thing he's looking at is the severity because largely we're in the severity consequent business and that's what makes us uh, uh, move typically. Very serious marine casualty, uh, that's the loss of a vessel, uh, the uh, loss of life or major pollution. There is no choice. We are obligated under international law to investigate very serious marine casualties to UK registered vessels uh, and also uh, to vessels in UK waters. Uh, the obligation does sit with the flight state. So if a uh, Bermuda registered vessel has an accident in a UK port, it, the onus is on Bermuda to lead and take the investigation on. But quite often, uh, because of the uh, consequences and the importance we place on, uh, UK, saving UK waters and protecting our waters, uh, MEIB will sort of step forward and push our way to the front and actually take the lead on a lot of those investigations. Serious marine casualties, uh, serious marine casualties according to regulations, if anything, it's not a very serious marine casualty. But there is a set of criteria that, that, that 
that sets it up to a point that you need to categorize it as a marine incident. You could say the inversion of the near misses or hazardous incident, uh, but it's not as simple as that. A fire in an engine room could be a marine incident if it doesn't cause material damage, material damage stopping the ship from, from meeting its duties and its requirements. And also, you could categorize things as outside range. So, if a Bermuda registered vessel has a fatality 50 miles out in the North Sea, it's outside of our jurisdiction and we class that as outside range. So the decision's been made. Green's made the decision. He's going to deploy a team. Uh, once that decision's made, he will alert his team. He will appoint a lead inspector. That lead inspector will take that case from start to finish, and they will start doing their initial preps to get out the door. If it's outside hours, the team will typically drive down to the branch in Southampton, have a quick wash up, and off to go. Uh, Typically, we would only send, but we would never send less than two people out the door. And an average fishing vessel, I can say, up in Aberdeen would be two inspectors, a lead and his assistant. Having said that, there is no distinction between a lead and an assistant. They're both the same grade, they're both got the same capability, but one's just been given the lead for that case. Our investigation support team, they're working away and they're sorting out trains, planes, and automobiles. Uh, accommodation. The lead inspector is talking to the DPAs, he's talking to the masters, he's trying to get some situational awareness, he's making decisions on what sort of equipment we need to take, uh, how much staff we need, more and more electronic evidence these days. So quite often if it's a, a merchant ship, we will send one of our technical team along as well to recover the oodles and oodles of electronic evidence that needs to be collected. Uh, if it's a complex case that's you know, got hazardous care environment, we'll send our health and safety manager. Sometimes, if they're in lots and lots of trouble, we might send me along with them, and that causes lots of problems. So we arrive at the accident site, and if anyone has been involved in a marine accident and been on a ship when the likes of myself and my team arrive, uh, the captains in particular, chief engineers if it's involved in the engine room, are absolutely bombarded with all sorts of agencies. If it's a fatal accident in the UK, the police will be there. They will be calling at crime scene. Maritime and Coast Guard agencies enforcement team will be setting off uh, from Southampton in a different car to the MAIB. Uh, not to do with the environment, it's just uh, must be power independence. Uh, but we all have the same objective. We want to get to an accident site as quick as possible, and we want to get best evidence. What we do with that evidence might differ, and our overall aims might differ, uh, but we need to make sure that everyone works together. So our team will call in a big group meeting. If there's a fatality, we'll go and talk to the SIO straight away uh, and explain what's going on. As a group, uh, typically, uh, when I was a, a lead inspector, I would push myself to the front. Uh, we used to use terrible words like privacy, which was to upset the police and things like that. We don't do that anymore. Uh, we have a slightly different tone, but we make sure that we can get access to evidence as quickly as possible. The police have been talking about their crime scene, now we've talked about my accident site, uh, but we'll work together and make sure that we can all achieve what we need to do. Uh, a risk assessment. Uh, yes, please. Uh, really important as well. Uh, um, oh, sorry. Jump, jump to that. Yeah, risk assessment is, is really important. Uh, I'm not going to touch wood because it's not plastic. Uh, but in my 15 years in the branch, I think you've only had one reportable riddle accident, uh, yeah, riddle also, if MARB inspectors have an accident out on site, uh, it's reported to the HSE, they're not nice and cuddly and fluffy like the MARB, they're really tough and mean and you know, they'll come and investigate us. So we've been investigated once by the HSE, nothing in the end turned out too serious but involved uh, some of our inspectors getting radiated 
But accident investigation is without doubt a hazardous activity. But myself and the chief inspector do not expect any one of our team to do something that is dangerous. So make sure that they're highly trained when it comes to safety. They've got more kit than you, know, you can shake a stick at. It sometimes causes a lot of problems when the MAI didn't turn up to an accident site with all sorts of safety gear. And then everyone else is wondering, oh dear, is something we need to know. Mm. Uh, this was one of the few times my team allowed me to go out to an accident site. Uh, this was a, an accident down in the North Sea, Parkaway, and really sad accident. A 70 year old engineer officer uh, uh, was killed in a fire. Uh, we were on there for a week doing an accident investigation, fire investigation. On the very last day, I led the team down into the engine control room to put a laptop back. And while we were down in the engine control room, the engine caught fire and we had to evacuate the engine room, shut the engine room down, call the fire brigade, abandon ship, and then I had to ring up the chief inspector and explain that uh, we just had an accident. And the guys you see coming down the uh, gangway there are the fire investigators from the fire brigade. We then sat down in the porter cabin and that would investigate the accident. So anything can happen at any time. It's all about being prepared. So the exciting bit, the things that myself as an inspector and my inspectors now really <coughs> enjoy. Uh, being out on, on site, really, really difficult process. Lots of things to coordinate, but once you're into evidence gathering, you're in full evidence gathering mode, and there is lots of different types of evidence to get out there. Witness evidence, electronic evidence, CCTV, cameras, everyone's got a phone. So every person on that ship or in that harbour is a potential witness to some interest happening to phones come out. So we've got all this evidence to collect. Uh, documentary evidence, loads of documentary evidence. Uh, normally turn off my ship and ask for all these documents. I try and send a sheet out to the ship's master and the designated person ashore with a big long list of the documents I want. So they get a head start. But what typically happens, a young third officer gets thrown into the photocopy room for two days and start printing things off us because we won't take originals, we try and take uh, copies. And priority is given to perishable evidence. <clears throat> and what is the most perishable evidence, I hear you all say, is during the crop. Witness interviews, witness accounts are probably the most perishable on a consistent basis. And the reason we're on two hours notice, and the reason we get to an active site as quickly as we can, and the reason we need to push through the protocols to get to talk to witnesses quickly is because we do not want their accounts to be contaminated. Uh, yes, I've had witnesses who have sat there and barefaced lied to me, but that is very rare. Most people that we talk to are trying their absolute best to give their best account and supporters. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we get the location right. We don't want to march uh, the master of a ship who's just run aground into the local police station because they've got a nice quiet room we can use. We'll use somewhere that's suitable and they're comfortable with, typically a cabin on board a ship. We establish a call, we give them refreshments, we explain our role uh, and we explain to them that they can have a friend sitting. My experience of this, probably 70% of people I've interviewed in my 15 years have sort of declined the offer uh, to have a friend in. Uh, others have had friends forced upon them that happen to be the company solicitor or the DPA or the somebody from everyone's friend. In those circumstances, I'm very clear to the witnesses that it should be your friend and you make sure you're happy with the person who's sat in there. And I'll always explain, put the friend in there, the process, and then typically I'd ask the lawyer or the company representative to step outside for two seconds while I just check with the uh, witness that they're happy for that person to sit in. And again, nine times out of ten, they say they are, but I've had several occasions where they said no. Uh, we do note taking, and people are highly trained for that. Uh, like I say, witness interviewing is really, really difficult. It's a difficult task. And it's one of the things that we 
focus most on when it comes to training. Uh, and it's really important that my inspectors plan their interviews. Now, 90% of the interview on time is simple. You only ask three questions. The first question is, in your own time, in as much detail as you can, please tell me what happened. The next question will be, okay, thank you for that. That was a really complex and difficult. Could you tell me what happened from here to here, from here to here, from here to here? And then we get into some detail. Uh, but you need to have an investigation plan because you need to know the detail you're going to go down to later on. And it's not like the bill, we're not slapping people and walking out and saying, the chief officer said this and the now said that. That does not happen. Uh, one of the things I say to my inspectors all the time is if someone says something happened, it doesn't mean that that something happened. But equally, if someone says something happened and it didn't happen, it doesn't mean that person's lying. People fill gaps in. People have different experiences uh, and people uh, will try their best to help. Uh, and our job is to look at all the interviews and we'll do a composite and we'll look where there's overlaps. So it's quite an important thing. And last but not least, most importantly, You've got to treat all witnesses with absolute respect. No matter, you come across and go, oh, this guy didn't make it. You're starting to feel that in your own mind. You've got to remember, no <coughs> one got up that morning to have an accident. And you've got to treat people with respect. You've got to monitor them closely and look after their well being. And on a lot of occasions, it can be quite traumatized. Electronic evidence, like I said, lots and lots of it. Our primary source is our boy data recorder, Richard North and his team. Uh, 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 like I say, they are world experts in this and uh, people from all over the world come to the MEID for, for advice, for training, uh, for uh, trying not to use the word manipulation when I talk about evidence, for the uh, uh, electronic evidence to be processed by the team. Uh, Machinery data loggers, fire protection systems, the list goes on and on and on. And like I say, there's Richard North, he's uh, our long standing technical lead. For many years, when I joined the branch back in the day when it was black and white television, uh, Richard was very young. He was the only person in the technical team, uh, and it all seemed to work okay. At the moment, with autonomous <coughs> ships on the, on the horizon, all sorts of remote monitoring systems going on, all this, the uh, electronic evidence going through. Richard's team now has been uh, bolstered and he's now got four in his team and they're still busy, so lots and lots of things going on. Uh, once the team have finished their initial deployment, an initial deployment normally lasts about five, five days to probably maximum two weeks, but on average about five days to to six day deployment is normally enough uh, for, for a typical accident. They'll return to the branch, uh, they'll process uh, the information they've got, they will do some initial analysis, identify the safety issues, the technical team will do their stuff, they'll do what we call a mad ass replay, which sort of blends together all, all the timestamps for the CCTV, for the voyage data recorders, for the AIS. Uh, for all this different electronic stuff, and we'll see a whole 360 picture of what's happened. And the lead inspector will stand up there in front of the whole branch and present the findings. The branch review follows a similar format to our report. Tell us the facts, tell us a bit of background, tell us your analysis, tell us what actions have been taken, tell us what recommendations have been issued before, what are the safety issues. It's peer reviewed, can be quite awkward. Or, or your peers asking you lots and lots of awkward questions and you're trying to answer them. Uh, but decisions are made in that meeting. The chief inspector will be sat at the end of the table, very wise, like Solomon, making really wise chief inspector like decisions <laughs> about what sort of investigation is it going to be? Is it going to be complex? Is it going to be short? Are we going to investigate at all? Are we going to put it to bed with a, with a short summary? What type of report are we going to produce? Do we need any follow-up work? What sort of follow-up work do we need? And also, uh, are we going to issue an urgent safety bulletin? Uh, I think this is the last urgent safety bulletin that we've issued. This came out this year. 
this uh, is an investigation being done by uh, one of our new inspectors, Simon, very, very experienced uh, marine engineer. Uh, fire investigation and with fire investigation, very complex, lots and lots of things for Simon to investigate. And it's going to take him, hopefully, a year to maybe 14 months for him to actually complete that investigation and get a report out on the street. But one of the issues that we identified straight away was the fixed firefighting system, the carbon monoxide fixed firefighting system. When the crew went to operate it, when they needed it most, it did not work. Our initial investigations identified a quality control issue uh, and the pilot pipes, we found that uh, several of them hadn't been bored right through. We issued urgent safety bulletin and there's all sorts of actions being taken from that. There's 50 odd companies that are potentially affected by this batch of uh, hoses. So quite an important thing to do. Investigation follow-up work, lots and lots of follow-up work. Uh, I, I love follow-up work. When I was in inspector, I loved doing all sorts of trials and things. But we normally involve high-level company visits, going talking to the chief executive officers, the owners of vessels, all this sort of thing. Uh, additional interviews. Don't normally like having to go back to re-interview witnesses because accounts change and uh, 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 people's re recollection changes a bit. But we do do that. Passenger questionnaires, if there's big passengers, lots of people involved. Uh, and then we do lots of underwater surveys and uh, wreck recoveries. Wreck recoveries, we did one last year, and it cost about a quarter million pounds. Uh, so it's a, a big, big expense for a branch that's budget is four million pounds a year. Uh, but we do it, uh, uh, and it brings lots and lots of information. Typically, what would drive us to do a full wreck recovery? Uh, one of the main drivers is usually to do with stability. Uh, and we need to get our naval architects and the specialists involved uh, to, to, to actually recreate and, and do all sorts of stability assessments for us. We do lots of non-destructive testing. Non-destructive testing we've got to be very careful about because the people I mentioned earlier, the police, the health and safety executive, the MCA enforcement uh, department, they all need access to this evidence. And if we go and break it, and then they come and ask us for what we've done with the widget. And they say, oh, we broke it to five pieces. I'll give you a photograph again. They get very, very annoyed. And um, we'll work through our news to make sure that uh, we work with them and um, everyone can get the opportunity to see sort of testing like that. Do a lot of drone surveys as well. So normally about six to eight months into an investigation, the investigation is complete. We've done all our business. We're now doing a, a recommendation meeting. At that recommendations meeting, the likes of Andrew will be invited into the building. Uh, anyone who are our stakeholders, our liaison partners, I can see Ian up there has sat in, in the MEIB's very comfortable and very welcoming uh, conference room uh, and give expert advice to us uh, from the Maritime and Coast Guard to point of view. People, stakeholders, companies who can help the chief inspector make the right decisions about appropriate recommendations because the worst thing we can do is give out lots and lots of recommendations that are just not achievable and the chief inspector really values this interaction to make sure it is the right thing. Uh, we're in, coming on the, the final phases now, the report writing phase. Now as an inspector I was a tunneler and climber. I loved gathering evidence I love analysing stuff, sitting down, activist, seafarer, having to spend three months writing a detailed report, didn't really float my boat. It's a very difficult thing to do, and we work really hard on it. Uh, the reports, the investigations can be great, but we can't write it in a way that the important people, the IMO, the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, Lloyd's Register and other classification sites. If we can't make an argument that makes them take an action or accept a recommendation, then it's a waste of time. So the writing of reports really difficult. The hardest thing is to get it down in the first place. So our inspectors will produce an inspector's draft. Their inspectors.
inspector's draft will go to their principal inspector, who will then send it back to the inspector and ask him to redo bits of it. It will then get passed from the team principal to the technical editor, who will look through it, give some advice, sort out the semicolons and full stops. It will then come to me for my review. I'll send it back to the team inspector to tell him to do a few changes. We're all getting annoyed with each other by this stage. It will then come back to me. I'll then pass it on to the chief inspector. The chief inspector will then pass it back to me and tell me what's what to change. But we then get to a point where we've got a very well reviewed uh, uh, branch report. It is a branch report. That will then be sent out for a 30 day consultation period and that will be sent to anyone whose reputation could be adversely affected by what we say. Now, I said right at the start, our aim is not to apportion liability or blame. We're in our regulations. There's a little tiny bit in small print that says, except where it's necessary to tell the story. So we don't apportion blame, the readers do. And you'll we'll see in the press by government, MEIB blames Fishing Vessel Skipper for this, MEIB blames Lord Register for such and such. We don't blame anybody, but the reader will take away their side of it. We get our consultation responses in, uh, and we will respond to every single question or, or challenge that we get from the consultees. We might not change our report, uh, very often we do, uh, but if we don't, we will explain to that consultee why we have not changed the report as they requested. We're then publishing the report. Now, what we do during the investigation, we must keep next of kin, uh, friends and family, fully informed of what's going on. Uh, my inspectors will always offer and always try and push the next of kin to allow us to come to their houses or whatever suits them for us to show them what we've done and for us to explain the technicalities of the report. Uh, because a well-written report should be able to be read by families, people who are non-technical and follow it, but it's, it's what we need to do. Uh, it's a difficult thing to do, uh, but it's often a very rewarding thing to do. We have to do media. I don't like it, I'm rubbish at it. Uh, but luckily, when it comes to doing the media, I'll say a lot of stuff, but it's very nice to do, and we'll just crop a bit out. Danny Harwood from the MAID says, Whatever you do, wear a life jacket. All the other stuff, we crop that out and we get some really clever and intelligent in the media to tell the story from. Uh, so we do lots of media handling, uh, quite important. And then finally, the last thing in the investigation process, MEIB inspectors and our reports will not be used in a court of law. They will not be used in any criminal prosecutions. We will not give evidence uh, in any criminal uh, uh, cases, uh, we won't even get involved in civil cases, but we will talk at uh, coroner's inquests and fatal accident investigations. Uh, our team will turn up, the lead inspector, and he will explain and talk to our report and help the coroner or the fiscal uh, make their decision and understand what we've said. And then finally, my very last slide, I've talked all about the investigation report, our end product, other things we do to try and get the message out. Uh, I do get lobbied a lot by my staff all the time, but I'm a lot younger than me and uh, more up with the, uh, the, the modern uh, culture. Um, we're always trying to find new ways of getting stuff out there, videos, uh, Twitter, all this sort of stuff, uh, but publication-wise, uh, Safety Digest magazine to put out lots of anonymized accidents, very popular. Uh, that comes out twice a year to so put safety flyers out with fishing vessel investigation report because trying to get people to sit down and read a 40 page report uh, in a very busy industry, it's quite difficult. But we can have a flyer up in the seaman's mission or the fisherman's mission that we can have a quick look at uh, that might draw them in to read the full report. Uh, and we also do safety studies. The latest safety study, or the last one we did, was on ECDIS, uh, and that was published with that in conjunction with the Danish Marine Access Investigation Branch. Um, that's it from me. I know it's been quite long, and normally I like to 
asked lots and lots of questions, but it'd be a lot of fair uh, taking questions from the room and uh, missing out the guys online. So I'd be more than happy to take any questions and field anything you want to ask me. Thank you very much, Danny. Well, let's... I'm going to defer to Lizzie just for a second there because I think we've got a couple of online ones. Uh, well, I have to try and find them. There's definitely two. But well, uh, well, we can take a quick one for the room while you're trying to get the mouse yeah. up. Yeah. Anybody got any questions? Yes, sir. Not only uh, we must do investigations on UK flag vessels, and it is really, really rare for us to let another flag state. So say we have a UK flag container ship have an accident in uh, Hong Kong, uh, we would fly to Hong Kong and we would investigate that. But quite often, for the chief inspector, we have powers to investigate accidents happening in UK waters on any ship. Uh, sometimes we'll contact the flag state. So, like I said, I use uh, uh, I use Bahamas again as an example. Say a Bahamas registered ship has an accident uh, in Southampton, we might contact the Bahamas and say, "Are you going to investigate this?" And we leave it to them. But quite often, because it might. Southampton Port Authority might have a really big role in this. Uh, that we say, well, actually, we're going to take the lead and do it. So, quite often, we'll do that. But also, we've got all sorts of discretionary powers for, for other boats in the area. And, like I said, quite often, other flag states ask us to conduct investigations on their behalf. We've conducted investigations uh, on, on Marshall Island registered vessels, we've done investigations. Like I say, on, on Norwegian vessels. So, if we've got the expertise, the chief inspector is open to requests for us to, to step forward. Uh, online, Brian Rice says, I've read many MAIB reports purely out of personal interest. They're a good read. Uh, one common theme is how well written they are with good use of English and clear style. This is not a common trait for engineers. Well, thanks very much. Um, <laughs> and bringing offshore crew or people in general. Does the MAIB employ someone to edit and standardize the text for each report? Brian, I'm going to talk to you direct. Thank you very much for that question because, like I said, writing these reports is hard, hard work. And Brian, you can send that to me, I will pass that on to my team because I can be the villain in the branch quite a lot because Danny and the chief inspector is not passing it. The guys working incredibly hard trying to get the toll right. It's quite easy when it comes to engineering. I'm an engineer myself. When it comes to writing engineering reports in particular, it's really difficult. Same with naval architects, stability uh, investigation, because sometimes you're going to take a leap of faith outside the theoretical side of it to generalize and make it easy to read uh, for wives next to kin and things like that. We do have a uh, technical editor uh, and she uh, works hard to make sure she keeps us on the straight and narrow, uh, but also right from the inspector right through to the chief inspector. It gets knocked around quite a bit and it's a difficult process <coughs> uh, I'm really pleased that uh, you feel that way. Thank you. Should we quite be guys? Anybody in the room? Yes, sir. Um, I think we're thinking of your interview with the witnesses, given the nature of the industry, and if you have um, interpreters on that. We do. Really good question, actually. Uh, uh, we have to make those decisions uh, before we leave the office, typically, but so many times we'll arrive at the ship. And when we'll suddenly come across someone who can't speak uh, good English, um, investigators have to think on the feet quite a lot. We have a we have contracts in place. We have a government service that can help us, so we can get the right interpreters uh, out at the accident sites. 
but also in the right even to interpret what's being said on voice data recorders. Sometimes we have to get crew, say we're in the middle of nowhere and we've got a lookout who's struggling to speak English, then we need to try and find someone on board who can speak good English and translate for us. I've had all sorts of strange cases. I've had people's wives translate for me. We've had inspectors with Google Translate, but we try and do it as best we can. Uh, and if you know there's a situation where we get proper interpreters in, uh, and it's something that we work on all the time. I've given an investigation down in Japan, set off to Japan on my own for a follow up investigation. Uh, I didn't speak any Japanese. When I left Osaka on the train, I was feeling quite confident. I had two stops to change. And once I left Osaka, there wasn't an English word to be seen. And it was only luckily that the train was on time and we went to get off and get on. Uh, but I arranged the local Lloyd's surveyor to come and translate for me on that investigation. Uh, the Lloyd's surveyor spoke very good English, only a tiny bit better Japanese than me. Uh, but, but we got by. So, yeah, translating really important. Uh, we even translate our reports as well uh, if necessary. Uh, and if you can't translate, we'll get the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office to send someone from the embassy in whatever country to deliver a report to the next kid. And read it to them. Yeah. So we've got another one online from Paddy Palvin. Do you investigate near misses? Uh, yeah, Paddy, we, we do actually. Uh, uh, we call them <clears throat> marine incidents. Uh, and some of our some of my favourite investigations I've done uh, have, have not been classified as a serious or a very serious casualty. Uh, we did a full report on an accident that didn't actually happen on, on, on one case up in uh, Scotland. I remember uh, we had a small fishing boat, went out in the fog, two people on board. Uh, they were lost for two days. Uh, the Coast Guard rescue was stood down. Uh, we sent a team up there ready to go and interview everybody. And as my team landed in the airport, these two characters turned up out of the fog. And they got the compass back to the front. Uh, so there wasn't even an accident, but we wrote a full report on it, and then it was quite an interesting. So, yeah, we, we do trend analysis, we'll keep an eye on common themes. Uh, we have lots of incidents involving uh, fast rib boats and things like that, and we've done lots of investigations in the past, because we can see that these safety issues one day will, 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 will result in it. So every now and then, the Chief Inspector will open an investigation into the uh, to the room. Who's it? I'm I train or I teach on the safety of the board, the shipboard safety of the Do you find, bearing in mind, I train them to gather evidence after an accident, are they doing that or do you find that because a lot of people don't realise that if they are a safety person, they're supposed to have done some kind of training, they don't necessarily read Oswald. Is that an issue, or do you think that's a good thing? Uh, especially given the amount of time potential it could take you to get to an accident. Yeah. Preserve the evidence. Exactly. No, see, yeah. Really, really important. Uh, companies must make sure that their crew, the people on board their ships, do have the knowledge to conduct an accident investigation. In and it's a different mindset when it comes to accident investigation. Uh, you know, ship's captain might do an investigation, like that's the chief officer or the chief engineer doing an investigation. But I know personally, when it comes to doing internal investigations, it's very difficult to be objective, especially if you want to get on in life. I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, it was the chief engineer, but I think that's the wrong button, you never trained. <laughs> So we need to make sure people get the right training, the right knowledge. Uh, and we do find uh, uh, companies do. I'm sure at Wars Action, have the likes of the Wolsey, so really, I think I've been Wars Action investigation course many, many, many years ago when I did the RFA. I know Carnival have put in massive effort into training their crew on board the ship. And I know all the crews in the industry are doing that. They're training their own action investigation, investigation capability ashore. So yes, 100% of good accident investigation uh, will benefit all these companies. Uh, 
Um, if I get an accident report form that comes in and the company send in a detailed accident investigation report, that is one of the key triggers that will stop me sending a team. Well, actually, this is good. This is a great report. They told me everything I need to know and we're confident that they're taking it seriously. If I get an accident report form that comes in, I oh, I now need to ring them up to ask a few questions. All of a sudden, the door's open. Once you start asking one question and lifting one stone, it starts taking off. So, they're uh, 100% to uh, training for the ship's crew and, and ship's uh, safety officers, really important. So, back online, Andrew Cooper. Does he have any idea get involved with evolving damaged ship scenarios, such as a listing ship after grounding, or is work strictly after the scenario is stabilised? Uh, so, what are we saying? We get on board while it's still unstable. Uh, okay. uh, they might have a particular vessel in mind at that point. Uh, I, I couldn't imagine it's all the south of it, right? Uh, the chapel, which one are we thinking about? I, I was thinking, so uh, related. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to my Inspector Safe uh, slide. I'll do that picture. Uh, yeah. Inspector Safe is my favourite person. Uh, like I say, I will never expect my team to do something dangerous, but they have to work in hazardous environments. Uh, and yes, they will go on board ships that don't look in great condition. I've actually been uh, on the bridge of a ship while it's still on fire, uh, while the shore fire brigade are conducting uh, uh, fire work on board. Very careful not to get involved. Uh, that one was a worker as well, was it? No, 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 that, that was down in Dover. Uh, so yeah, we will go on ships that are the ground. We will go on ships that uh, might appear to have been some issue. But before I commit my team to do that, there'll be a lot of interaction. We've been talking to uh, the classification societies, the uh, p &I surveyors, all the people who've already got there, they have an awful lot of information. Uh, and I have to be quite sure myself that it's safe to go on board. But also it's, it depends on what is to be gained and the value of putting someone on board. We talk about it quite a lot. Would I winch uh, Richard North and the team of techies down onto a, uh, a cargo ship uh, in the North Sea rolling around blacked out with not knowing what's going on uh, in case it goes aground. No, I wouldn't. But what I winching down onto a cruise ship with 4,000 people on board, uh, and the evidence that we can get can be absolutely critical for the actual investigation. And that's another matter. So it all depends on the circumstances. But yeah, we have gone on board ships uh, while they're still around and while they're listing for uh, uh, detailed risk assessment supports them. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so you were saying when you before you make the report public, you give it to the to the stakeholders involved. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, obviously the, the industry is quite a private company, is quite private about their operations, and do you get a lot of pushback from the company itself about what you like? Obviously, you've got the evidence; and it's not you're not making lies, but they. Do they push back quite a lot for what you've reported on? Do they want a lot of changes? Yeah, it, it depends on the circumstances. Yeah. Uh, uh, we can't tell you who we talk to. We can't tell you what we say. Can't tell you talk to Andrew all the time. Andrew <laughs> Dole, he's, he's always getting these uh, things through the post. Sorry, I forgot the rules. But uh, companies, even flag states, everybody, if they read the report, the reason we go out to consultation is you know, there are experts out there who know it far better than I do. Uh, we've done our absolute best to get the research right. We do something silly like have the wrong end notice in there or something like that, or quote the lot the wrong the wrong rules. But most people who we consult will come back and help us. That's a Danny, thanks for that. Whether they good report, but the 25 pages of things I want to talk about. Uh, and someone suggests this might be a better way of working. And we end up with a better report. Obviously, if we've got something wrong, then we've got to put it right. 
and we will we respect that. Now, sometimes we will get a lawyer or a company whose reputation is about to hit the media. You know, they know this. Uh, so they might challenge lots and lots of things. And they've done their investigation. And their witnesses might have told them something. And they might have a bit of evidence here, a bit of evidence there. And they quite honestly come to their own conclusion. But then their witnesses might have told us something different. Because we won't give witness accounts out to anybody. Unless a high court says so, and it's never happened before to the NIB, uh, and we won't tell people we've interviewed. Uh, and we will go back to them explaining, well, actually, uh, no, our evidence shows this and shows that. And, and it's, it's what's expected, it's standard. Uh, an average report, normally quite easy to turn around consultation. If there's a massive problem, we go out for a second consultation phase. And that, I can't remember my 15 years if we've ever gone for a second consultation phase because it doesn't happen very often. And most people, like I say, are trying to help us. And even if a company does come in and really have a hard point to make and we decide we're not going to concede, uh, they might take quite an aggressive stance early on. But once I'm stood up in the media and telling everyone what we found, uh, companies will not normally stand up and say we disagree they normally say thank you for the work and the tip that in line what's going on. So yeah people will challenge us and, and, and that's right so it's some quite interesting. Um, <laughs> so back online again. Um, Will says how long do you normally spend on site for investigation, do you find there's pressure to do things quickly? Uh, typically, uh, I mean, we sent a team to Ireland uh, for a very simple case last week, and they were away for three days. Typically, I'd say five days is an average. Uh, so if that was an on call, I'd say I'm going out the door, I'd typically expect to be out for five days. Uh, we had a case we did down in um, uh, South Korea where we had the I don't know if now, but it's yeah. uh, it's how long was part next door? Uh, uh, I'll come to it in a minute, uh, senior moment. Uh, but we had a team out there for four weeks living in South Korea. Now, are they under pressure to come back? Absolutely not. You know, they're in my they're listening, and they'll tell you they're not under pressure. Not. They've got to get as much evidence as possible. They're under pressure when they get back because they've been out of the office for a long time and they need to catch up with some of the work. Uh, but no, we try try our best not to pressurise the guys uh, to come back. And sometimes we're on the phone nagging them and saying, are you sure you don't need to go and interview someone else? And so it's that thing. So we, we try our best not to, uh, to put any pressure on them. We need to get better. So you get pressure from companies trying to sail their vessels away, for instance, or uh, any problem with holding the vessel long enough to gain the evidence. Yeah, we, 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 we do sometimes, but not often. Uh, the Chief Inspector has powers to make a ship stay within our region or in a place so we can conduct our investigation. Uh, very, very, very rarely. If we turn around to a company and say, we need to be on there, we need to do our investigation. Most companies will be fully cooperative. Uh, in the background, I can imagine all the pressure that they're under from their senior board. Why is why Danny and his team holding the ship? We, we appreciate that and we'll try and accommodate. We'll try and get on there as quick as we can, get off there as quick as we can, but we'll also sail with the ship. And sometimes we'll leave the ship, fly to the next port to meet the ship again. So we try and not interrupt the, uh, the working of the, the ship, but we need to, to keep it there as long as we can. Okay. I, I read a couple of reports that have noticed that you sometimes use extended company in areas like these where you are you be, uh, not up to the top, so of course. You, you, how do you deal with those 
extend both these companies in, in your investigation? Okay, so we have a contracted list uh, that we try and maintain. Uh, so we, we have certain test houses that we use a lot. We have certain <coughs> naval architects we use a lot. We have professors who are experts in uh, cold water shock. We have these sort, of, these sort of expertise that we know about. Uh, when it comes to uh, get an expert opinion, we need to go out to competition. Uh, so we're always looking for people to tell us, give us their details, tell us what their expertise is, so when a case comes up, we can ask them. Uh, when we do get an expert to do a bit of work for us, uh, we may decide to put that work in our report as an annex. We may decide to quote some of the outcomes of that work, or we might decide not to use it at all. Uh, when we get a test out or an expert to do work for us, that becomes our property and we can do with it what we want. Uh, the Chief Inspector protects that work, but he has discretionary powers that he could uh, issue a technical investigation that we've asked someone else to do for us to other parties if he thinks that's appropriate. But yeah, we, we, we rely on, on experts quite a lot, so it's quite handy uh, uh, to you. Uh, so another one online. Gareth says, "Do you have an MOU with DAIB about your expertise?" Well, Gareth, you've got me out pub quiz. I'm going to tell everyone what DAIB is: uh, the Defence Accident Investigation oh, right. okay. Branch yeah. Board. Uh, Gareth will tell me that was very long. Sorry, Gareth. Uh, we do have an MOU with the DAIB. Uh, and we do quite a bit of work. The DAIB are basically the Ministry of Defence's Accident Investigation Branch. Uh, they're actually working at the moment to get similar regulation to the AIBs, so some of their evidence that they collect becomes protected, they're working on that. Uh, but yeah, if, if you've got an accident uh, involving the Ministry of Defence or the Royal Navy ship, we will work on the aims but we'll still be working independently of the DAIB. My very first investigation when I joined the branch in 2007 was a tragic loss of a, a, a young lady called Kylie McIntosh uh, out of the army cadets on a rigid road of capsize. And I deployed with what was in those days in the DAIB. Back to the room. That's a really good question. That's it. Uh, uh, we've actually got one of our principal inspectors who's been nominated autonomous lead, uh, which means he goes to lots of conferences and, and goes to talk to people and lots of sandwiches. Uh, we are currently thinking hard about it. There's all sorts of work going on in the department, all about future proofing our regulations, because how are we going to go about regulating ships that are being driven from San Francisco going up and down the English Channel. Uh, our powers, we've got powers of access to all premises in the UK, we've got powers of access to all ships in the UK, we've got powers of access to ships that are UK registered anywhere in the world. But what happens when we want to go into this remote bridge to talk to the guy who's actually the master of the vessel. And we're working on that now. Uh, there are lots of things going on. Uh, Carnival in Hamburg and uh, in Miami and CMA CGM down uh, on the south coast of France. They all have massive remote monitoring centers. Big massive complexes where they're actually monitoring every single vessel in their fleet live. There's information coming back from the, uh, the, the sensors, from the machinery. Uh, we've got chief engineers and captains sat in these centers. Uh, and when we do have accidents, I think I did, uh, Jay Jones, one of my team, led the Vasco de Gama grounding in the, uh, in the Solent a few years ago. And we actually went to Marseille and we were given full access to their remote operating suite to see what we do. Uh, at the moment, uh, 
most companies respect the NEIB's UK powers when we go into their country. We find it remarkably easy to actually get access to all these companies where our powers aren't really there. But what we do do is before we deploy something next, I'll send an email to our equivalent in that country telling them that I'm coming onto their turf and could you please let the company know that uh, you know that we're coming uh, we can use the, the powers of the active investigation branch to do in those particular countries. It's very rare that we need it because like I say most shipping companies they are trying to do the right thing uh, and uh, are keen to cooperate. So we're watching that one, it's a really important thing. Ryan Rice online says, if you do a report on behalf of another flag, do they reimburse you? Oh, good question. Uh, yes, they do, Brian. Um, no, they don't, Brian. Uh, <laughs> we have a MOUs with uh, what we call Category 2 Red Ensign Groups, which are the, the Falkland Islands, uh, Centrelina, all these small places, uh, out in some exotic places in the Caribbean and stuff. Uh, and they invite us to do an investigation on our behalf. We did one Commodore Clipper grounding down in Jersey for uh, Guernsey, for the Guernsey uh, authorities. And we say, yes, uh, we will ask you to pay us. Uh, but typically, we stop at about 30,000 because we know that if they're going to do their own investigation, no one other than the UK and the NIB will happily spend £100,000 investigating uh, what other people might see as an average accident. We spend a lot of money and commit a lot of time. Uh, so we like to do it for the people. We'll claim the majority back, but we normally put a ceiling on because if we say we want you to pay for everything, and then all of a sudden we say, oh, I've just detected that rope for 250,000 pounds. That's what we're really interested in out. And they go, we did tell me, so we need to keep our independence. So we do that. With the Red Ensign Group, we have an MOU with the Category 1, like I said, and they actually pay us uh, an annual fee. Uh, and that annual fee basically pays the true inspection. So, yes, we do ask the money back, uh, but not as much as the good old British taxpayer actually pays. Back to the room again. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to ask uh, like uh, there are uh, flag states involved in a solution. So one is a uh, UK flag and the other is a non In this case, do you have uh, even undertaken uh, the investigation of the non flag? Um, otherwise, we have to do one part of the story and then how it works. Now, another fantastic question. These are things we deal with all the time. Uh, we've got an investigation going on in Norway, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Denmark at the moment, uh, where we have a UK registered vessel in collision with a Danish registered vessel uh, in Danish waters. So you would think that the Danes would take the lead for that. We deployed a team out, we met with the Danes, we then met with our Swedish counterparts because the people involved in the ship went to Sweden. Uh, we investigated together and then we came to an agreement that MEIB would lead the investigation. MEIB will publish the report uh, and, and that's where we're at. Uh, we've got the Danes who are actually doing work at the moment out there that are going to support us and it's, it's, it's registering itself at what we call a substantially interested state. Um, big uh, collisions down in, the, in Gibraltar recently and again it was the UK that took the lead. Uh, and typically, in those circumstances, it's very rare for us not to lead. There's one case actually, uh, uh, Zephyr Lumos and another vessel container ship down in, uh, uh, a long way away, uh, that had a collision and we actually left them to, to lead them. But I think it's quite important to, to point out that. NAIB is actually probably still the biggest marine accident investigation branch in the world. We've got more marine specialists than the NTSB in America. So we have got a lot of staff, so we are resolving the research. Okay, 
Looks like we've run out of questions online for now, and this is any further down lower. So uh, the room has it. Yeah. Tony, hi, thank you. Um, how do you, obviously, the details in the MOU is like shipping, but how do you work out who takes ownership of the physical numbers that you take ownership? But it must be really difficult when you've got a similar way to the else in one list of time. Is, is there a rule, or is it just first go, they say it? Uh, uh, first come, first served uh, is quite an interesting concept. Yes, we're in the branch as quick as we can, we're in the car, we're off. You will notice we've got a much more powerful car than MCA enforcement have got. Uh, so we're trying to get there quickly. But no, no, it's not first come, first serve. Uh, we have had issues, and that's why we have the MOUs, because if we'll turn up to an accident site, and I'm going, accident site, policemen are going, crime scene, accident site, crime scene, we can't come in. We have all these MOUs to explain to them our powers and explain to them what we need to do. Uh, what we will then do is we explain as well that everyone can share factual evidence, we can share the widget, but we assure them that we're the best people to take it away. We'll look after it, we'll explain to them that we'll give them access, we will allow them to witness and see destructive testing, we will even pay for destructive testing together but they'll write two reports, one with the police written on the top and one with the NIB written on So that it can't turn up with an NIB logo in a criminal case. It's all this sort of thing on. So we do work very, very closely to make sure that we maintain evidence trail. Because what we don't want to do, and the NIB were very keen, we think that it's far more important to learn lessons from an accident. But MCA enforcement, HS, HSE, the police, they all have an equally important role because the general public might want uh, someone to pay the consequences for something. Well, that's not the business where you uh, but they need to do the job of that. Okay, and um, Lizzie's tapped to watch out, and so possibly got time for one or two quick questions. If anybody's got any burning issues that they still want to raise, yeah, one more. Anybody? Yeah. Back again. Sorry. Um, so I'm doing my PhD in uh, CFO and resilience after the traumatic incident, and I know one of the accidents that you mentioned today already, the person involved, their father died a few days before the accident. So obviously that must have been playing on his mind. How many accidents did you say that you've investigated? There's been some kind of emotional event. So I, I know at least two or three MRD reports where there's been either a near miss a few days before the big one. You know, so it's how many do you look at that side of things? Yeah, we do. There are, there are a lot of stresses out there. Uh, and I have conducted really interesting interviews where uh, the interviewing the ship's captain, for example, will tell you this whole account and be very stoic because that's what we are in the industry. Uh, we'll just tell it as it is and do our duty. But then we come to an end of the interview uh, and we do a thing called a fatigue questionnaire that basically asks all different questions. We do it at the end because we don't want to do it. We've got a questions about alcohol, we have questions about this, that, and other. It's as if we're looking for something. Uh, and we asked them these sort of questions in a sequence, and I've had people break down at that stage and then tell us all about stresses and problems that are going on at home. Uh, and then we need to talk to them, uh, give them the right advice that we need to talk to. Uh, and if that comes out in our analysis as a, a significant contributing factor to the accident, then it will be reflected in the report. Uh, yeah. it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard life for at sea these days. These guys working six on six off, non-stop. Uh, there's so many family issues going on. You can imagine what it's like at the moment the Ukrainian and Russian seafarers out at sea at the moment. You can imagine the distractions that they've got. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It's interesting even listening to the pilots when the, one of the 
work of the DRM course among the pilots in Sam Chapel, which was the first person of the a Russian timber ship that was lit in severely as a part of a New York Taylor a couple of Christmases ago. And he said he did this with almost like the relief of the crew when he managed to get on board because they'd been living sort of like, you know, walking on the boatheads for a good few days. And it must be the same in a way when you arrive on the ship because it's like, oh, you yeah. can explain what's happened to somebody. And we know that we're not going to blame them. Uh, well, we well, did do an investigation uh, down in um, uh, down in Cornwall not so long ago. Where the, the crew on board and not get the fare, had no money, uh, there was no fuel to, to, to buy. We were having a terrible distance, and then you know the time for a ship to go yeah. Well-being of seafarers is big headline topic. Yeah, certainly. Especially the way the NAIB does accident investigations and talking about the stress and all that kind of thing, and having been involved in a few incidents and scrapes of my own, I think one of the most important things is when you do an accident investigation, is you don't stop at the person that was directly there. You've got to look beyond what might have caused them to do something and say, why did they do that? Look, look further up the chain look at the causal factors way beyond why that individual made a mistake. Because exactly like Danny said at the beginning, you don't get up with a seat bearer and think, I'm going to mess it up today. You absolutely intend to get it right, and sometimes it doesn't go that way. So anything that we can do, MEIB, LR, lots and lots of MCA in the Zoom, lots of other wars ash, Obviously, clearly, it's all about trying to prepare people not to get it wrong on the day, um, but also to learn from the opportunity, which is why this is such a great lecture for Danny to present to us and give us so much of his time. So, uh, this is definitely giving me the eye now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Danny, for uh, that excellent lecture and answering all of our questions. I'm sure everybody in the room would like to give a round of applause and everybody in the room. Well, it's time to, it's always a pleasure to, to talk about active investigations. We probably aren't really passionate about it, but we love talking to engineers, love talking to naval architects, I love talking online to people who think they Sue, and I've resisted doing my Johnny Cash impression all the way through. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. And Liverpool are kicking off in five minutes, so. I'll get on. <laughs> okay.